uh, for this March Wellness Forum, uh, today we are going to tackle transformational leadership. And we have our speaker for the day, Mr. Martin Ocheng. Uh, so I will go straight into in introducing our speaker for the day. Thank you, Mr. Ocheng, for creating time to be, to be our speaker for the day. So just a brief introduction of our speaker. Mr. Martin Ocheng is a holder of a master's in business administration, degree in strategic marketing and management from Oxford Brookes University, England, and a first class honors bachelor of science degree from Moore University. His career spans over 28 years of experience in international trade, business management, and leadership in industry, leading global organizations. He's, ha he's held several leadership uh, roles in various organizations like KWV International as head of global marketing at Tyco International as a marketing and strategic director for Africa and Middle East region and uh, as um, MD for Tyco commercial services for the region and also as CEO at GHM South Africa and also has been an MD for SGA Kenya. He's uh, the current chairman of the board of directors of the Global Compact Network Kenya under the auspices of in United Nations Global Compact, as well as a board member of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. Currently, he is the Group Managing Director of Sassini PLC, which is a Kenya premier agricultural business. This uh, just a brief introduction of our speaker. I'll go ahead and invite our speaker, Mr. Martin Ocheng, to take us through the forum. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Mukabana, and thank you, everyone. I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are audible. You could turn on your video if that's possible. I could. I was I was going to keep it off just to make sure that it doesn't interfere with the with the. Yes, band. you are audible. But if uh, if you want it on, that's absolutely fine. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, first of all, let me start by just appreciating everybody's uh, time this morning. It's a bit early for a meeting. Uh, I am guilty of asking for this time because of the day's schedule. And I'm very grateful to all of you for agreeing to, to hold and start this a bit earlier than you probably normally do. Uh, we'll take uh, just over an hour, maybe one and a half hours to allow me to finish this and then move on to the next thing. We have our annual general meeting today. And so I need to dash to that uh, uh, after this. Um, again, my gratitude to Dr. Mkabana for pulling this off and for reaching out to me um, some time back uh, to try and see if I could get involved in what uh, I think you guys call your wellness program. It's a bit uh, heartwarming for me to have a discussion and a topic like this in a wellness program because the word wellness denotes uh, so many things, uh, mental wellness being one of them. And uh, leadership is an aspect of, you know, what one then gets to from that perspective uh, of mentally being well. Um, a brief sort of like uh, flavor into my past, just to give you a bit, a bit more insight. Uh, I'm a Kenyan born uh, almost five, over five decades ago. I went to school here and went to the university here as you've heard uh studied biological and medical sciences then joined the pharmaceutical industry in the early 90s uh working as a medical rep and so i do have uh, some escapades of dealing with uh, medical fraternity with doctors pharmacists nurses and hospitals uh promoting you know r d drugs uh for various uses uh first of all in 3m healthcare which is part of the 3m conglomerate uh, and then later on with Wana Lambert, uh, which some of you may not know because uh, it stopped existing in 1999 when it merged with Pfizer and became Pfizer Incorporated. Uh, I worked in that industry for close to 16 and a half years um, as someone marketing products uh, for prescription uh, for various ailments uh, across different geographies, uh, starting obviously in Kenya but then ended up uh, on the global stage, luckily for me. I then left uh, uh, that industry while I was based in South Africa and joined the alcoholic beverages industry as head of marketing, coming out of my specialization in strategy and marketing 
from Oxford and um, uh, was there for about four years driving global initiatives in marketing strategies and operations for KWV, which is uh, South Africa's biggest wines and spirits business. Uh, we, we did our work in over 64 countries. It gave me very good experience of seeing how different cultures interact with uh, the element of entertainment and driving strategy for those cultures was something that I really cherished. I uh, then um, luckily uh, got involved with uh, another American business called Tyco Incorporated, which uh, is the world's biggest fire and security business. Um, TYCO is the way it's spelled, and was responsible for a lot of projects in uh, security aspects in global enterprise, but also in residential security as well across all the big markets. Uh, at that stage, I was running the business for Africa and Middle East based out of Cape Town uh, in South Africa. Uh, got back home around 2018, I had a short escapade with SGA Kenya. I was consulting for them, but eventually ended up running their business for about just over a year before Sassini called me to ask me to come and join them uh, in what is my current job. I've been here precisely four years. I joined on the 1st of March, uh, 2019. And Sassini is uh, East Africa's biggest agricultural business. Uh, we are involved in the growing, uh, producing, parking, marketing, and exporting of tea, coffee, macadamia, and avocado uh, to markets as far as Japan and South Korea in the Far East, uh, to US uh, and Canada in the West, and everything in between. Uh, our tea predominantly is sold in bulk uh, to the Middle East. Pakistan you know, is our biggest buyer to the Asian markets, uh, to Europe, uh, and to North American countries, uh, North African countries rather. Our coffee uh, goes to the US mainly, uh, but also is sold in uh, Japan and South Korea and in Central Europe. Our avocado fruit is principally sold in Central Europe. So Germany is our biggest client, uh, the Netherlands, France, and the UK. And our macadamia nuts are uh, almost fully sold in the US. We export them uh, as primary produce, so we don't export finished products. And that's very deliberate as a strategy because we want other players to, to take advantage of the extension of the value chain with regards to adding value to those products and then uh, packing them for their consumers to, to then use uh, off the supermarket shelves or the kiosks or the coffee shops that they, they, they go to. Um, today, uh, we are poised to be the continent's biggest agricultural business in another few years. And the reason for this is uh, the kind of leadership we've had in the last few years and the strategy and direction that we are taking. Uh, we're very confident that will take us there. And so when uh, Dr. Mukabana asked me to talk about transformational leadership, in a way I thought it was appropriate because of what's going on in Sassini. But then I also wondered that this is the experience I have uh, and the examples I do have are very corporate. And um, so I just hope that at the end of this session, uh, what we'll have discussed in terms of the basic principles uh, are applicable in your field, uh, whether you're working in a medical team of doctors or as an individual consultant running your own clinic or whatever it is that, uh, that uh, you, know, you end up doing. Uh, and, and I hope this is one small part that then gets into building you as a holistic individual uh, to become a transformational leader going forward. So yeah, let me just get into it if that's okay. The way I want to structure this, I, I am more comfortable when it is a discussion. Uh, I'll just touch on aspects of terms, transformational leadership and what we do in corporate with a lot of examples, if I may, uh, coming from what I've done and what I've been able to be exposed to because those are the best ways to then tell you something I've already done and I saw being successful. And then um, I'll open the floor for some interaction. I'd like a lot of participation there because uh, as many questions as can be asked, I would then use those to maybe expand on some of the subject matters and give you as much feedback as possible to make it uh, useful for you. So um, let's start by just, I don't know, you, you, you know, the medical field is, uh, is uh, very academic and, uh, and I appreciate that. The business world is, is less, so it's more experiential. Uh, of course, it's based on a bedrock of academy as well. 
But uh, by definition, transformational leadership uh, is any leadership that causes serious change, if I could use it simply. And that's, those are just my words. I'm not uh, referring to any paper or anything like that. If you lead in a way that your intent and results are to cause serious change, uh, either in individuals, in corporates, or in social systems, then you're a transformational leader. It, it really is self-explanatory. Uh, it's moving something from where it is to where you want it to be, but it's gonna be a big, a big change. In some cases, that change is uh, in one leap. Uh, and so that, that leadership then is transformational quickly. In some cases, it is in small strides and it takes time. Uh, in both those cases, there has to be a, a vast difference with where you end up from where you've come from. And this is very different from transactional leadership. Transactional leadership is what you see every day in your, in your work and in what you do. It's a give and take scenario. It's a boss walking in or a manager walking in and demanding some work from you. you doing that work, getting the result and moving on. It's very routine. Transformational leadership is based on a leader's personality, a leader's traits, a leader's values, and ability to inspire, to help drive that change, uh, to cause that difference, and to be you know, the person that is able to pull people uh, to follow him uh, to drive that. And so charisma and values and ability to lead in an inspirational manner uh, is really, really critical in transformational leadership. You've got to lead by example, in my view. And the views I'm giving you are mine. Uh, obviously, different leaders will have different views on this subject. But, uh, you know, when you've been involved in changing organizations, especially from a cultural perspective, towards achieving one, a different culture, and two different results, um, that can then prove that, uh, you know, you move them from where they were to where you wanted them to go or where the organization wanted to go, you've transformed that business. And so you must have these traits. Um, it goes after challenging goals. Um, it, it doesn't sit there and you know, look for routine goals that are easy to achieve. Uh, otherwise, you won't transform anything. You've got to be able to say that we are sitting at one and we want it to be at nine. And to get at to nine, you know that's going to take some work. That's going to take some effort. It's going to take some pulling together of the teams, uh, and so you know that's a huge change. If you want to move from one to two, it is a step, but it's really not transformational. And so uh, it, it really is difficult to be transformational if you are a routine leader that is doing everyday bits and everyday work. Now, in your field, um, leadership comes in different ways. I have been away from the medical fraternity for some time now, and I'm sure I'm out of touch uh, with the way the industry works. But I think the way it's set up is pretty much the same uh, like it was in the 90s when I was working there. Um, you know, leadership comes in different forms. One person leading another one person, or one person leading a small group of people, or one person leading a big group of people or a big group of people leading an even bigger group of people. So all forms of, uh, of leadership, but usually the individual, there's one key factor, one key individual that drives the process. And that's why uh, every leadership scenario is then linked to a source, a, a person that is definitely driving uh, the goals that are uh, driving the organization or that individual or a social setup towards achievement of those goals. And, in this form of leadership, you've got to be able to be working towards uh, benefiting the individuals you're leading, benefiting the organization you're leading, or benefiting the social setup, like in politics, for example, that you want to lead. Um, transformational leadership then calls for you to be less individual in your traits and more group in your attributes. So you think about the people that you lead because you want to inspire them to follow your vision. You want to inspire them to to be uh, different from, uh, from, from who they are. I'll give you an example from my current uh, engagement. When I joined Sassini in 2019, in one of our big businesses in the tea business, um, we grow tea on about 7,000 acres uh, in Yamira and Kericho County. That's huge as an estate. That 7,000 acres uh, only accounts for about 50% of the tea that we require to produce for our customers. So the other 50% comes from small scale uh, farmers that we call outgrowers uh, that you know, grow their tea around the areas where our estates are. 
in 2019, all that tea was being hand plucked. In other words, it was picked by hand, which is a very original way of harvesting tea uh, from when tea was first grown in Kenya uh, 120 years ago. Uh, whereas it is effective and it's an old skill, it is an obsolete skill. Uh, it's also very expensive. It used to cost us then about 15 shillings a kilo of picked tea by hand. And so um, what had happened in the tea industry over the last 20 years is some companies have started moving to different forms of automating the picking of tea uh, using shears, for example, two man held machines where you drag the machines over the top of the tea to pick the leaf. And uh, in some cases, in some countries like Japan, they were already looking at big harvesters in the form of tractors. And so there was this stepped approach that one needed to take to move away from plucking tea by hand to go to full mechanization. We set a goal then that within a year, we wanted to be 100% mechanized. I don't even think the board believed us because it looked such a Herculean task in terms of implementation. We set off to Japan to go and talk to manufacturers of tractor harvesters uh, to design them for our terrain and the kind of tea species we had in our fields. Uh, long story short, by April of 2020, we rolled out, uh, in, in, at the very start of COVID, we rolled out that mechanization uh, or uh, our automation of picking tea in our estates. And within one year, uh, we achieved 100% conversion from uh, hand-plucked tea to mechanized harvesting. That involves transition of about three, three and a half thousand employees that we had to absorb elsewhere or give something else to do because the machines uh, replaced the work that they were doing. But we had to do that one to give sustainability to that business from um, a, a cost perspective. So a kilo of tea picked by a tractor machine today cost us two shillings. When uh, as uh, picked by hand plucked individual, a kilo used to cost us 15 shillings, 75 cents. That's huge when you're picking 70, 80 million kilos of tea a year. And that really accounts for you know, the change that we were looking for in terms of profitability, but also in terms of industry leadership uh, from an automation perspective. And so to achieve that, we had to align uh, the leadership mantra and the leadership belief around this is doable. Um, I believed it with every bone in my body. I don't even think the leaders we had in the tea industry believed it as much as I did, because I could just see you know, the benefits of it. And so when we rolled it out um, and, and in the middle of the, of the pandemic, um, we took a huge risk. And that's another aspect of transformational leadership. You've got to be uh, somebody who's got a, a very healthy risk appetite without overdoing it, because then you could really collapse the leadership style and the results that you're looking for. And so we took that risk. And um, today we are the most mechanized tea business in Africa. Uh, in our estates. The tea that comes from our outgoers is still picked by hand because uh, that's the nature of that business. But about 15% of that tea that comes from outgoers as well, we've then since convinced the bigger outgoers with bigger estates to mechanize as well. And we've helped them with that process. One, to bring their cost down and two, to improve the quality because the quality of tea you pick with machines is much better than the quality of tea you pick by hand. That's a transformation. And that now is something that is stuck in the business. It's not going to move uh, back to you know, what it was before. And so you can see from that example that uh, it is critical for the leader to have that belief. It is very critical for that belief to be shared with the core leaders. Uh, I don't lead alone. Uh, my style is to lead with others. It's a leadership mantra I learned in business school called core leadership. And what it calls for is uh, putting a a small core team together uh, that shares your views, shares your values, but most importantly, shares your vision and is able to help you drive it down the organization to achieve what you want. Um, I believe for you to be transformational, your goals must scare you. Your goals must be something that when you think about, you, you, you have some sleepless nights and say, hey, am I going to achieve this? Otherwise, they're incremental and they might not end up being transformational. And so uh, those transformational leaders that are successful, they work within the existing culture, knowing very much they want to change that culture. They also work within the existing set of results, knowing very well, I'm not happy with these results. I really want to like treble them or change them to something different. Uh, and if you have that goal, 
uh, and you drive your team through example, through empathy, through leadership, through motivation, through exquisite communication where you're very clear about the goals that you're setting and what you want, you'll achieve those results. To give you an, uh, an example, uh, that year when we joined, when I joined Sassini, uh, not just the tea business, but the whole global uh, business of Sassini, I think we lost 400 million shillings after tax because of um, you know the issues and the way we were running the business, where that wasn't friendly to us uh, that year. We just closed our, um, our financial year in September last year, uh, three and a half years after having made 1.2 billion shillings after profit. That is driven by a big impact of that mechanization in the T, also driven by introducing the same year in 2019, our macadamia business, uh, which is now contributing handsomely to the overall results as well. That's the kind of stuff that is called transformational. So if you're moving from losing 400 million to making 1.2 in three years, that's a, almost a 1.5, 1.6 trillion swing. Uh, because of doing things that you believe in. That is, uh, unfortunately, in the corporate world, uh, we are measured by those financial results. In your world, those measurements may be different in terms of what you want to achieve, but that's what transformation is. It has to be big and very different. And how do you measure this? Um, because to, to, do, to do things just, you know, and then say theoretically that I'm transformational is one way, but we are big on measurement in the corporate world because then that's the biggest sign that you're achieving what you want to achieve, but also that you're headed towards the goal that you've set. So um, there are several ways to measure this transformational leadership. One is your influence on others, uh, the followers that you've got. Do they work for you because they have to, or do they work for you because they want to? If they have to, you're being transactional. If they want to, they will give you more results than you're seeking from them. And in that case, you're being transformational. Mm -hmm. your, your followers need to trust you. They need to feel motivated. They need to admire you. They need to stay loyal to you and they need to respect you. For you to achieve those things, you yourself have to be a worker. You have to be able to roll your sleeve, sleeves rather, go to the shop floor and work with them in the things that matter to the organization, in the areas that are critical for achieving those results, whether this is in medical practice or in a corporate business like Sassini. Uh, if the leader is one that sits on the shop on the top floor and looks at the guys on the shop floor with disdain, the guys on the shop floor are gonna work for him because they have to. They want a salary at the end of the month. It doesn't motivate them to do anything and he's not doing the work with them. If you humble yourself and you bring yourself to their level, work with them, drive them, giving them that vision and direction and constantly reminding them, this is why we are doing this, because we want to go there, you'll achieve that result. And that brings out the other aspect of this leadership style, humility. You can't be a transformational leader and be arrogant. If you're arrogant, even arrogant workers will not want to follow you. And that's how bad it is. Uh, and if you look at the best transformational leaders, whether it's politics or in business or in, in, in families or in social setups, they have a certain level of humility and that comes to them naturally. They don't learn it, it's just who they are. But they balance that humility because sometimes humility is misconstrued to mean weakness. Uh, and so you have to balance that humility with strength in driving for the results that you want, in driving for the achievement of the results that the organization seeks. Um, and so for me, that humility although sometimes I lose it because, you know, sometimes humility also lets you down. But you naturally, when somebody looks at you, they must be able to see somebody they admire, somebody they want to be like. Followers of such a leader want to work for you. And for them to want to work for you, you have to motivate them and to drive them uh, to, that, to that level. What are the traits of a good transformational leader? Charisma I talked about earlier. Charisma just talks to when I see this guy or this lady, I get inspired. I just know that whatever is gonna come out of the interaction I have with him, it's gonna help me to be better. It's gonna help me to achieve my job better. It's going to help me to you know, want to do more. And if I have to sit in the office or in the clinic for an extra hour after my work day ends, I don't mind that, why? Because it is geared towards achieving something greater than what I thought I would do today when I came to work. The charisma talks around the way you carry yourself, the way you respect others, the way you talk to people. Um, I see when I go to hospitals, uh, medical uh, 
staff have name tags. And so you can read Dr. Eglen Cabana. So you know that is what her name is. And I get amazed when um, I call somebody by their name because that's what you do with this empathy. And they get surprised because they don't always remember that they're wearing a name tag. The effect of calling somebody by their name is huge on leadership because it shows that person that you're aligning with them, you've got a certain level of interest in them and in what they're doing. And if they don't know you, that effect is even bigger. It's like, how does he know my name? Um, you know, things like, for example, if you tell me about your family, I might meet you in the, in the staff shop one day and ask you, hey, how is your family? And you say to me, well, you know, my son was sick today, he didn't go to school. And I allow you to tell me that story and you tell me your son's name and all that stuff. One year later, when I meet you and I ask you how your son is doing by his name, it shows how much interest I had in that story. That motivates you to say, wow, he really cares, even though he's the CEO or even though he's the top doctor in the business, he cares about me as an individual. He still remembers that story. So you've got to have charisma. Number two, you have to be an intellectually stimulating person. You can be a transformational leader and your ideas are dull. Your ideas are not clever. Your ideas are uh, you know, retrogressive. Also, your ideas are closed and you can't be a transformational leader if it is your ideas only that get the light of day. And so I've learned in my, in my experience, the best ideas come from the people who do the work, not necessarily from the leaders, but the opportunity to express those ideas, the environment given for those people at the lower levels in the organization to express those ideas is really, really critical. I don't know how it is in the medical practice today, but I know in medicine, as in legal services, for example, hierarchy is a big issue. So if there's a doctor who uh, went to medical school before you, uh, there's a certain admiration for that, just from an age perspective. If they have more qualifications as in specialization in a certain field, there's a certain admiration that comes with that. And if they get to the level where they're a mister administrating a whole hospital, there's a certain ad uh, admiration for that as well. If they're a professor of their field, you even admire them more. The problem with that is the admiration is earned by qualification. And that's not a bad thing because that qualification must be respected for uh, the effort one has put in, in, in gaining it. But the better admiration uh, should come from you just being intellectually sharp enough to convince people and allow people to then bring those ideas on the table to help you move that subject that you want to transform. And so what I found in my own experience is listening as a skill is probably the most important thing you can do as a transformational leader. If you're one who always leads the discussion, gives direction before you even have that discussion held, then you're being transactional. And there's nothing wrong with transactional leadership because it is needed to get the daily tasks done, but it is really transformational. And so if you want to really, really change things, you've got to use the people that you want to do the work to help you think through what you want to change. So that intellectual stimulation that you drive in your team is really critical. You don't have to be the sharpest person in the room. Sometimes, actually, it doesn't help if you're the sharpest person in the room, because then uh, everybody thinks you have all the answers. It's, it's impossible to have that. It's As a CEO, I can tell you now, there's no one task that I take where I have all the answers. I have answers in the people that I sit with, in these co-leaders that uh, help me to run the business and in their people down the organization that give us ideas. For you to do that, you've got to interact at that lower level. You've got to interact with people who are your juniors, the same way you interact with people who are your seniors and listen, because in listening, you pick up uh, a lot of stuff that uh, you didn't know yourself. And then lastly, what I would call uh, a, an important trait of a good transformational leader, and I talked about this a bit before, is empathy. Uh, the ability to be able to sympathize with a situation or empathize with somebody's uh, issue. I didn't meet this deadline because. Now, means you didn't meet the deadline and that's an issue, but you have a reason. And if that reason is plausible, I, I can then say, okay, fine, that's okay, but let's try and do A, B, C, D to get back on track, not shouting at you. Uh, and that's why I was saying earlier, humility is a critical trait of this leadership style, 
because um, it allows you to see other people's perspectives from their own viewpoints and to see other people's struggles that you may be ignoring because you're the boss and you're the leader and and so you know you're just not being empathetic enough enough to the people that uh, that you work with so i would say charisma intellect and empathy uh humility underpins all those uh, all those situations and so it, in your, if I could bring it back to your field, and I, I hope we can do this when we get to the questions uh, and answer session, is uh, how many of you feel uh, in your work situations that your leaders give you those characteristics and those traits? And yes, he may be a professor in oncology, but when you look at him, are there things you'd want, apart from his qualification or her qualification, are there things you admire about him away from the technical aspect of what he does? If you can answer yes to those questions, then there's an element of transformational leadership in, 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 that, in that leader of yours. And so here are the four key areas that I think uh, in starting to summarize this short talk, uh, that if you are to take away from this, I would urge you to. One, um, individualized consideration. I'm calling it empathy, but it's also that connection to the people that you lead. Now, in my case, my direct reporting team are uh, 13 people. It's a big span of control. And so uh, I have to remember that I have to be available for each one of them to help them with the work that they do. Uh, a lot of them are MDs of businesses. So we organize our business into uh, 45 actually different distinct business units, each led by a managing director or a general manager, depending on the size of the business. And so in their own right, they are leaders because they've got a whole set of people helping them to run those businesses. And so my, my role with them is to help them to co-lead those businesses. And in return, they help me to lead the overall business. Uh, and so I believe in, 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 in three things. And I talk about this a lot when I talk to people about the traits of what I do every day. And the first thing, and I think this is critical for transformational leaders, is uh, being decisive, decision making. And so when you walk to me with a problem, I don't expect you to come ask me for solutions. I expect you to come with a set of solutions uh, from which I'll then say, let's make a decision. My role is to help you to decide. And in fact, if you can make that decision without me, the better, because then you're also growing as a person who's being decisive. It's always good to make a, a decision, even if it's a bad decision, a bad decision can be changed. But indecision is a big, 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 big letdown when you're driving transformation or when you're driving effective leadership. The second thing is competent delegation. And I think in your field, this is very important is you can't do everything as a leader. And so you have to let other people help you. In my case, I call it co-leadership. Uh, in other cases, people call it delegation. Uh, but once you delegate, then you have to let somebody do the work. For you to do that, that person has to be competent enough to do that work to the same level you would have done it yourself or even better. And that's why I call it competent delegation. You don't just delegate for the sake of delegating because that really is useless. You know, um, that person will take three weeks to do a two day job. You might as well do it yourself. So you have to be very careful when you're choosing who to delegate to and what you're delegating to them. Their ability to be able to, you know, to do the job excellently. Uh, and I think that's very relevant in the medical field. The third thing is engagement. That engagement talks to the empathy I was talking about. Walk around, know your people, know who they are, know what struggles they've got, uh, applaud their successes publicly, criticize their failures privately so that they have a connection with you. Learn from them as much as you want them to learn from you. Uh, the good thing about being a leader is not, not, not if you accept that you don't know everything, uh, you become a better leader because sometimes you manage people who know things better than you. You might have a PhD in a certain specialized field, but somebody with a master's degree will probably have more knowledge around that field than you probably do. In academics, people don't believe that, but in business, we see that a lot. And so you've got to be able to have that individual connection to people that you manage and that's a big element of being transformational. The second thing, and I've talked about that, is that intellectual stimulation. Um, let's have a clever discussion. Let's not sit here with the head of the business unit and talk about how it rained last night. That's good, but that doesn't help the business to go forward. It doesn't help the work that we're doing to go forward. It's good for banter, but if you're spending a whole 
uh, day talking about things that are not progressing you towards this transformational goal you've got, you're not going to achieve it. Number three is the idea of motivating people, the inspirational aspect of leadership is, gosh, I want to do this because I don't want to let Martin down. I don't want to let my, my head of department down. In fact, I want to be one of the better people who's achieving these goals quicker so that I can be given more to do. The ability to open yourself uh, because you're motivated to do the work by the person that you're looking up to. And then you have to have idealized influence. So idealized influence talks to the fact that the big ideas, yes, come from the top. Uh, the goals and the strategies and the vision of where you want to drive that transformation must come from you. But once they are put on the table, you must express them to people that you're leading in a way that they grasp them and they are able to then articulate them to people below them as well. And so, you know, those four aspects, individualized con consideration, being aligned to people and checking in with people, uh, being the intellectual stimulant in the organization, uh, inspiring and motivating your people and being the driver of ideas, the big ideas, uh, not necessarily the implementation is going to give you what you're looking for. So um, in, in starting to conclude so that we leave enough time for, for, for discussion, uh, I would then say that um, when we get to that discussion point, let's, let's try and zero this down to areas of your experience where you may have challenges or questions that you can ask uh, that maybe I could use my experience to, to, to then give you answers and deeper inspiration around this uh, as, as people who want to be transformational leaders or will in the future be in a position to, to lead something that you want to transform. You've got to be able to develop a challenging and attractive but difficult vision for people to believe you. It has to be big enough. I said earlier, if it doesn't scare you, then it's probably not going to give you what, uh, what you want in terms of uh, you know, driving that big difference. You must go home sometimes wondering, gosh, did I bite too much here? Uh, am I able to deliver this? Because then it scares you. It gives you more uh, insight into that intellectual capital that you have to lead the organization and inspire people to try and drive that as well. It also must tie that vision that you've got to the overall strategy of what you want to do. Why do you want Kenyatta Hospital to be the biggest in the continent? What's the reason? So if that's the strategy, then say, okay, we, we're gonna make it the best. We're gonna make it the biggest. We don't just want referrals that are national. We want referrals that are continental or maybe even international. What do we need to do to get there? You have to give that a vision tied to the strategy that the organization has, if you work in Kenyatta, for example, to, to achieve that. Then you have to be able to translate those plans into actions. Now, transformational leadership doesn't sit at the top and just give visions and then everybody works on it. You've got to be able to demonstrate what are the key performance indicators that in every section will help you to drive in their small way, the overall goal that you want to achieve for, for, for that business, for that organization, or for that department. You've got to have confidence in tackling those plans. You've got to have optimism. People have to pick that positive energy from you. Look at this guy. He's in the office at six every day. I don't have to be in the office at six, but hey, he gets so much done. No wonder, because he adds two more hours to his day uh, just so that he can drive for results. Now, that doesn't mean become a workaholic. It just means be dedicated to the course. Be dedicated to the drive that you have for helping your organization, your department, your business, your social setup to achieve what you want to do. And then one last thing before I go to Q&A, celebrate your small wins. Transformation doesn't come in one step. I said, if, if it is a big leap, then it's something huge uh, that has happened. Usually it comes in small strides, but those small strides then end up in the results that you'd have achieved with a big leap anyway. You've got to be able to achieve that by celebrating every little success you've got. So if you're in a leadership position, uh, take time to just review what you've done and be happy with the success that you've gotten, set the next challenge and move on. So yeah, that, that's, that's my sort of like small summary into what a transformational leader is. And so Dr. Mkabana, if it's okay with you, I'd like to then open the floor to to the people on the call, I see there's 72 of us, so it's a big group. Uh, I don't know how you usually coordinate this. Uh, if people raise their hands on the system to then ask questions, or if we have a moderator to, to, to help direct us there uh, and see if we can get some more insight from the questions you ask. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Martin.
So we already have some questions in the chat box, so we can tackle that as people prepare to raise their hands and ask <laughs> questions. So there's a question from uh, Zephania Ashira. What are some of the books, bi uh, biographies, autobiographies, personalities that have influenced and inspired you as a leader? Oh, that's, that's actually a very nice question. Uh, I'm an avid reader, not because of wanting to be a better transformational leader, but because I believe I just don't know enough. Um, and that reading is, uh, you know, structured very differently now from what it was 20, maybe 30 years ago uh, when I was getting into these leadership positions. Then, as you would remember, uh, books were all in paperbacks. You know, you had to go and buy this book, sit down and read it. Uh, and I think that I had more time earlier on in my career to read than I have today. But I've stayed committed to, uh, to reading as a culture because uh, even if I'm reading something I already know, it just goes to emphasize um, that thing that I already know. But in most cases, I'll find one or two things in every book that I read um, that uh, I don't know. And, and that inspires me to keep reading. I try and read um, in some five to 10 years gone by, I used to do about a book a week. Now, if I get a book every second or third week, I'm happy. And I've moved from paperbacks to online books because it's just easier to read. So instead of being on WhatsApp, answering chats, uh, when I wake up at 4, 3.30 in the morning, the first one hour I spent, I spent doing that, just reviewing some leadership subjects or some business aspects that I, worked, I want to learn more about. And so because of that, you can imagine how many books I've been lucky to read. And it's very difficult to pinpoint uh, one in particular. But there are very, very uh, many good books and very many good authors uh, that write good books about leadership. There's a guy called John Maxwell. Um, he... I think he's overdone it now because he's written so many books on leadership, but he does have uh, a book on transformation and transactional leadership. He has books on different leadership styles. He has books uh, written around uh, how leadership has changed uh, from a hundred years ago to today. He has a specific book um, and I can research that and, and put it on the chat a little later or, or send it to you to share, which compares Western leadership style, European leadership style, and Oriental leadership styles. I find him a very good leadership author. But there's some books that are self-help books as well that talk to you individually around what you can do to improve your work, to improve who you are uh, as a leader. And some of them are not even about leadership. They are about self-growth and personal growth. And they could be in the financial space in your life, or they could be in the inspirational space in your life. I've even seen some spiritual books that really help you to be a better leader. So there's, there's an, a, whole, a whole array of books one can recommend. I, I think what I should do is to sit down and maybe write like my top 10 books on leadership. I'll share them with Dr. Mkabana and then you can share with the group. Most of them are available online. And because of the time it takes to read a paperback, if, if reading a paperback or if reading is not your culture, I would suggest online or audio books. Audio books are the same books you buy in the bookshop, but they are narrated in a cassette or in a, in a, in a memory stick or uh, in a CD that you can play in your car instead of listening to reggae music when you're driving home. Because there's a whole lot you can learn in that 30 minutes or one hour that you're sitting in traffic, uh, you can do a lot. Um, I have a, a lady in my team in South Africa when I worked there that learned Portuguese as a language, listening to it, driving to and from work over a six week period and she became fluent in it. That's the dedication of reading. Uh, and so nowadays reading is not just picking a paperback, it's also listening to audiobooks. It's, it's reviewing um, uh, clips online that uh, are relevant to the subject that you want to find. Um, I find LinkedIn a, a very good resource center. Uh, if you're able to pay for LinkedIn premium, I think it costs about $25 a month, I'm not sure, I think it's there about, but it gives you access to a learning center LinkedIn has that has all these many courses that you can then train yourself on, uh, get certificates for, and listen to the best people that do the work that you are wanting to do in big organizations across the world. Uh, what I do is I dedicate the first uh, two hours of my 
Friday every week to do that. And so you can imagine how much resource over a year of 52 weeks of just going to learn on a LinkedIn platform uh, and how much that improves you. Uh, paperbacks are still good. Uh, it's still very nice to pick a book when I'm traveling, uh, sitting at airports waiting to connect or sitting on a plane that is taking 17 hours to the next destination. Perfect time, I have zero interference from anybody. You can sit and, and, and read a book. And um, I would imagine that if you want to be a good transformational leader, look for books that are inspirational, look for books that help you to show empathy, look for books that help you to become more intellectual. You'll achieve that. So I'll share a list with you, Dr. Tari, and then you can share with the team later. Okay, thank you very much. There's another question from, uh... Okay, very informative talk. As doctors, we are ever with our patients. How do we manage to transition from just being in hospital to one, playing golf, two, being directors of companies, three, having a life? And second question, do you believe in staying in the same company for long or moving as you grow both in salary and tasks involved? As th those are many questions in, in, in those two aspects. How do you move uh, to do something better? I think your field is really a tough one because uh, it's it's a call uh, from what I understand. You know, not everybody becomes a doctor. When I went to university, uh, the qualifications to go to medical school, and I think that, that is the same today, were high. And so there was an intellectual barrier in terms of intelligence that would get you there. But that was determined by passing exams. And so you then went, and, and the reason for that was assessing the ability for you to grasp the hard subject of medicine or the hard subject of law or the hard subject of engineering or whatever professional course some of us did then. Um, then you get out and you start working. And uh, in my medical repping days, my best friends were doctors who were with me in college and uh, who supported me, one, because I worked for a multinational R&D organization that had good drugs in the therapeutic areas that they were treating, but two, because we had a friendly banter or a union from, from our past in college, having worked together or, or studied together or played some sports together. And I've seen, if I could use my friends as an example, over the years, as I moved to corporate and moved up the ladder, a lot of them stayed as doctors. Some of them wanted to stay because that's the call they're answering. A lot of them stayed not because they wanted to stay at that level of medical practitioner, but there are just not many opportunities for them to grow. Unless you go back to the university and specialize and then work in a hospital setup, then start your own private practice. And even those who run private practice still work in hospitals because yes, there's a call to it and uh, there's a need to grow as well. So if you want to move to you know, greater things like be a director in a company, first of all, you've got to be able to be uh, adamant on adding value. You have to be deliberate about this. You can't sit there as a doctor uh, interacting with patients and that's what you do every day um, and not seeking to grow. And that is why growth is really important. So the first question around reading is a self-driven way of growing. So you, you know, you engulf that culture, uh, you're going to learn more. And if I were you, I would not be reading in my area of technical expertise. I'd be reading in the area I want to grow in. So why do I want to be a director in a company? So I can bring maybe my medical knowledge there, but more importantly, some other knowledge that that organization needs. If I don't have that knowledge, nobody's going to call on you to be their director. We review people, we give directorships based on the value they bring to the board. Uh, and so that, that's what I would say to that. With reference to creating time away from your patients to be able to play golf, you must be deliberate about it. Um, life is not just about working. Uh, even in fields like yours where it is a professional call, it's almost spiritual if you ask me, because the allegiance you have to your patients is really admirable. We have the same allegiance to our jobs, but in planning our week, I have a day specifically where I am not available for the stuff that I do. And now, maybe that's not possible in your field, but that not being available allows me to create time to play golf. Thursday afternoons, I am not available. The office knows. And it's not something that uh, is secretive. It is part of who I am because it's part of managing the stress levels that I may be developing during the week, but also ability to meet and interact with people in a different setting away from the office. So if you want to do things different from you know, spending 24 hours with patients, 
be deliberate about those things, create time for them and then do them. But work with your seniors or with your schedules to be able to ensure that you're not letting other things down when you do that. So for me, the way I create those six hours on Thursday afternoon is I make them up in the rest of the other four days of the week. So I'm in the office early. Um, and the reason I come to the office at six o'clock is not because I want to show people that I can be early. There are several reasons. One is I'm awake at 3.30 anyway. So once I read something for an hour, what am I doing at home? I'm not sleeping. I'm not adding any value there. It's best to dress up, come to the office. Number two is when I get here at six, I have two hours before everybody comes in where I have complete and absolute peace to be able to do what I want to do for that day. In most cases, everything I want to do for that day so that when people now come in at 8, 8.30, I have time to engage them. I have time to interact with them. I have time to open my door for them to come with those problems and solutions so that we can make decisions. I have time to walk around and empathize and interact and help other people do their work and be involved at the shop floor because I already did my day's work. And if I do that for four days in a week, I create enough time to not feel guilty going to play golf on Thursday afternoon or going to have lunch with uh, another CEO for one afternoon in a week because that also motivates me. You have to be deliberate. Um, the second part of the question, um, please repeat that, Dr. Ari. Um, second part, uh, do you believe in staying in the same company for long or moving as you as you grow both in salary and tasks involved? I, I belong to the transitional generation that was born to the baby boomers and uh, have sisters and siblings that were Gen Z uh, and now kids who are this uh, data generation now. And so I have a bit of uh, values from both worlds. If you ask me where my set of values come from, they come from my parents who are in that baby booming uh, generation. Their belief was go to school, get good grades, graduate with a top degree, get a job with good benefits, work there until you retire. And uh, I'm sure all of you have parents like that. When I sit with my mom today and I review her life, because I lost my dad uh, when I was in the university. But if I review my mom's life, she did that, and to an extent, it was successful for her. But to some other extent, there's some things she lacks today that maybe if she approached life and uh, worked differently, she wouldn't be struggling with. And so what I then said was to challenge that mantra. I don't think that is relevant anymore, going to school, getting top grades, getting a safe, secure job, working there for life and retiring at 55 or 60 or whatever the retirement age is, to then go do what? So um, when I look at my kids, they have a very different way. And I look at the generation that we are managing now in their 20s and their 30s, they tend not to stick around for too long. Why? Because they have this desire and appetite for instant gratification. So they want results now and they want to see that growth quicker. They don't want to wait until they're 50 to drive a Mercedes Benz. Now, if a Mercedes Benz is what motivates you, they don't want to wait until they're 54 to then build their first house. And in a way, there's something to admire about that. But I think there's a fault in the way they do it in terms of how quickly they think moving from job to job helps them. Now, there are two different things. You can stay for long and grow in that organization, or you can keep moving and grow with every step as you move forward. They, all, they both have benefits and they both have demerits. Um, I prefer stability. I prefer once you find the ideal organization that you want to work for, grow in it. The mistake people make is not to seek that growth by not advancing themselves and not wanting to be better and being comfortable and getting into a zone, especially when you start a family, you then turn your focus to your children. And so your career suffers a bit. If you want to grow in the space where you are, even if you're in the same company like I've been for, for quite some time, you have to seek that growth deliberately. But you could also do it the way the new generation are doing it, where uh, you know every two years I'll, I'll move because that gives me better pay. It gives me a newer challenge. Uh, and in 10 years time, I'll have worked for seven different organizations and I'll be where I want. I, I don't have an issue with either. I prefer being stable in one organization, but you have to drive your growth agenda. How you grow does not depend on your boss. How you grow depends on you and what you want to do uh, and how much you're putting into it in terms of uh, developing yourself. Okay. 
Thank you very much. We have several questions. So question from Eunice. In taking those bold steps and wanting big outcomes in transformation leadership, one is bound to make mistakes. How should one recover from a bad decision and turn that into a positive lesson? Mm. <laughs> People are scared of making mistakes because they think that life is perfect. I don't know any of you who can raise their hand and say that I have a perfect life because we don't. Um, and here is my mantra towards that. Success is an extremely poor teacher. There's nothing you learn from being successful. Absolutely nothing. Once you know how to ride a bike, you know how to ride a, bike, a bicycle. You, you, even if you don't ride a bicycle for 20 years, the day you pick it up, you'll fall maybe once or you stagger a bit, but within minutes, you'll ride that bicycle. You're successful at riding the bicycle. Where you learn lessons is where you fail, where you make mistakes, where you take steps that are not uh, ideal for what you wanted to achieve, and especially if those steps don't end up giving you the result that you want. You need to dust your coat, pull up your socks and say, okay, this wasn't a good thing. I need to make a different decision and be bold enough to make that different decision. Sometimes it involves going backwards to be able to move forwards. In other words, okay, I took this role to head this department, but I'm not succeeding. And so maybe I should go back to another department where I'm not the leader, but I'll be better, my skills will be used better for another organization that I can then now start driving my growth. Be deliberate. There's nothing more important to success than being deliberate. Uh, and, and, and don't sit there and moan about your situation because of what use is that? You're, you're, it's not giving you any results, it's not changing the situation. For you to change the situation, you've got to take action. And for you to take action, you've got to think about it. For me, and I'm saying this for me, I don't think it works for everybody. My life is dictated by what I think about and how I think about things then manifest in the actions that I take through the words that I say. Uh, and so if I'm unhappy about a scenario, I'll not complain about that scenario. I will say, I want a different scenario. And all my thought processes will be geared to that different scenario. Very soon, all my words will be geared to driving that different scenario. Before long, I'll be getting opportunities that are open towards that different scenario and I'll action one, and then I'll be able to move. Take action. Uh, but for you to take action, you've got to really focus your thoughts on what action you want, the desired one. Now, taking action through thinking uh, is sometimes misconstrued that if you think about the thing you don't want, you'll get more of the thing you don't want. So be deliberate, again, be very careful in your thought processes and what you choose to think about. We get the essence of what we think about in life. And so be careful. Whether we like what we think about or not, you could be thinking, I'll give you a very quick example. If you're broke and you don't have money, and you keep saying, I'm broke, I'm broke. Your kids come to you and ask you for something. Say, I don't have money. Do you think money grows on a tree? Go away and all that stuff. The world and the universe and all your experiences and your words and your actions and the opportunities that open to you are opportunities of no money because that's what you're focusing on. If you change that thought process and you say, I'm looking forward to the day I'll have money to be able to buy for my kids, whatever it is they want, to move to a house that I want to live in, in a suburb or an area that I admire, uh, your thought processes start to give you more of that. And before long, they multiply. Uh, and in size, those thoughts then give you words that are encouraging in seeking this before you know opportunities open there. That's just reality, I find. And so for me, your thinking process is really critical. Do not dwell on things you don't want. You'll get more of that. Dwell rather on changing them by thinking about the things you want. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And to the next question from Lorraine. Thank you for a very informative discussion. As doctors, leadership is often thrust upon us with little training, mentorship, and guidance. What are, the, what are your thoughts in career coaches and professional mentorship, pros and cons, specific experiences, and recommendations? I don't think you can do and grow without coaching, mentoring, and teaching. And those things are different. Uh, a teacher is somebody who imparts on you um, knowledge that they have about uh, subjects that, uh, that they know, uh, like a lecturer, you know. Uh, they don't necessarily have done what they're teaching you about, but they know theoretically what that subject is. Coaching is somebody who holds your hand uh, and helps you to do what you want to do. In most cases, they will have done that thing that they're helping you with. But in some cases, they don't. They just know what you need to do. They're just a coach. Uh, I mean, a good soccer coach 
doesn't have to have played football. We, we've seen many of them. Jose Mourinho is a very good example. A mentor is somebody who has done what they're asking you to do or what you're seeking them to help you to do, but also who's able to open those doors for you when the opportunity comes. So they, they're either in your organization already leading you and are able to guide you to the doors that they'd like you to walk through uh, so that you can gain that experience and, and, and growth. In my view, if you don't have a coach or a mentor and you want to grow, you can still achieve it, but it's harder. And so my advice is, I think the question is, what are my thoughts around it? I completely believe in it. Um, in my personal capacity, I mentor and coach a few people at executive level and a few people at even lower, lower management levels because uh, one, if they fail, I can give them something that could help them with what they're doing. I don't mind that. Why? Because that's exactly what was done for me when I was growing in the organization. So when I was younger, uh, I was given in some cases, opportunities where I was thrown into the deep end of the swimming pool and I couldn't swim. And I needed somebody to jump in there with me, hold my hand, show me how to kick and how to you know, move my hands for me to swim and, and be able to then manage that scenario. You need coaches and mentors. Uh, the difference comes in what you're looking to be helped with. Are you looking for somebody to just encourage you and give you a broader aspect of what you want to grow into, or in which case get a coach? Or are you looking for somebody who can do that, but also help to open doors by pointing you to what specifically you need to do, or somebody in your organization that can then place you on the table, mention your name in growth discussions with your leaders that then gives you the opportunity, in which case you need a mentor. It's really, really important to have. Um, when you're choosing mentors and coaches, be careful who you choose. Don't choose people you admire for what they've done. Choose people you admire for what they can help you to do for your own growth. You have to be selfish in that aspect. What can I gain from this? And don't choose people because of their positions. There's some people who are in leadership positions who have no idea how they got there. And so can't tell you how to get there themselves or yourself rather. And so you've got to be very, very careful. Take your time to be very selective in what you choose, but you do need a coach or a mentor to help you grow. Thank you very much. A uh, question from Zephaniah. We have so many leaders who we admire from the late uh, President Mwai Kibaki, Honorable Michuki, the late Michael Joseph. However, they have not shared their journey through a book, so it's difficult to learn from their journey and experience. Have you considered sharing your journey by writing a book? Yeah, I have a manuscript actually that I started writing in 2015, uh, but I just ran out of time to finish. I, it's a challenge th that uh, I still need to fulfill. Um, I think for me, the question has always been, do I have enough for somebody else to learn from? Um, so, so I pen a book, uh, is that going to be influential? And then when I, when I listen to the influence, sometimes I have like in Sassini or in organizations where I've worked, yeah, maybe it's time to put those thoughts together uh, in a book to be able to, to then uh, you know, share that with people. Um, so the answer to that is yes, I've thought about it. In fact, I have a first draft. That draft is seven, eight years old, so it needs a lot of review. Uh, it's something that is one of my bucket list things to do. Uh, and I want to do that in the next few years and see if that can be helpful to people. Um, in the meantime, what I do is uh, I, my door is open for people who walk in and want to benefit from my experience because that's exactly what I did. I benefited from other people's experiences. And in fact, for me, I didn't learn from their successes. I learned more from their failures, the things they didn't do well and they regretted about. And then they told me what they, they should have done. So then I can avoid making the same mistakes. Sharing that in any forum, whether it's a talk like this or a lecture at a university, or coaching people in my team, or through a book, as you mentioned, uh, is, is something that is desirable for a good leader so that you don't die with these ideas. God forbid tomorrow a bus knocks me down, then what? You know. So I think, I think it is important to be able to capture that in some form or manner and be able to share that freely with people. So I'm in that process. Uh, I feel encouraged by that question because I think then it should drive me to go back to finish that manuscript and see if I can convert it into a good leadership book. All right, thank you for opening your doors for mentorship. Um, a question from Duncan. There's so much to be done every day, ending up not getting time to read. Oh, it's a comment. It is, thank you for the idea about the audiobooks and being deliberate. So is the question, how is your typical day? 
Oh, <laughs> so I wake up at about half past three, uh, and um, because I can't sleep anymore, I think it's just from when I was in school, uh, sleep was a bit overrated. Uh, the school I went to had very challenging students, and so there was a very strong reading culture to pass exams. But once you pass those exams, you go to college and qualify, and you stick to that reading culture, it becomes to then grow you. And so uh, I developed this idea of rather than extend my reading time in the night to a later time for sleeping, I, I go to bed early and I wake up early. Uh, and so then I have an hour. And an hour is all you need. You can do a lot in one hour. You can do your PhD dedicating an hour every day to your subject in one year. And so uh, once I do that, then obviously I shower, jump into the car, uh, usually about half past five. I get to the office at six. Uh, by which time I'm the first guy in the office, there's nobody there. Uh, I have time to interact with the cleaning staff, get to know what's going on in their lives, sit down and do my work. Um, and like I said earlier, it's so peaceful. The phone is not ringing. I don't really have people sending me emails at that time. If I have work to clear from the previous day, that's the time I do it. If I have tasks for that day uh, that I can clear on my computer, that's the time to do it. If I have tasks that I need to prepare for, that's the time I do it. And then um, after two hours, people start streaming in, 8, 8.30. By nine o'clock, there's a beehive of activities in the office with uh, my direct reports, getting daily updates, or with people walking in with situations that they need my help in. Then I'm able to, because I've done my work already, I'm able to give them full attention and full input into what they want from me, help them to make those decisions or move forward the business. And then I do that until about four o'clock, uh, in my typical day, that's the time to go home, get home and, uh, and uh, do one of two things uh, in terms of physical activity. Either go to the gym, which I haven't done lately well because of just being in a different routine, or jump onto my bicycle and go riding. So depending on the day of the week. And that takes me to about six, half past six. I then get home on a normal typical day and uh, after showering, jump into the kitchen and uh, look for something to cook. Now, it surprises people when I tell them that I cook when I get home because I don't think it's a typical male thing, especially in the African setup. I don't do it because of those reasons. I do it because it's probably, to me, the most relaxing activity of the day. All the stresses I have and all the issues that you know caused me problems during the day dissipate when I'm chopping things and throwing them onto the fire in the kitchen. And what gives me most joy is then watching the family eat the result of that, that activity. And enjoy it, and 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 you know. Then after dinner, uh, we try and have dinner before seven o'clock. After which, uh, I have a flurry of activities. I could sit and watch a game if there's a game on. I'm an avid sports uh, follower, or if there's nothing important, watch a documentary or listen to an audio book. Then go to sleep. Usually ten ten thirty, and so you get enough rest. You wake up early, so by waking up early, you extend your day. You're able to put in time. Uh, to do things like reading uh, and do things that uh, your normal routine would usually allow you to. There is an excuse people use to say, I don't have time to read. I call it an excuse because that's exactly what it is. If you want to do something badly, you create time for it. Thank you. Oh, very interesting. Most people, men, look for something to eat in the kitchen, not to cook. <laughs> so next question. Uh, I think you've answered part of it. Do you have a family? When do you have time for them? Seeing your schedule. Yes, I do have a family and uh, um, they're scattered all over. So uh, my daughter is uh, a lawyer in Cape Town, um, just born and bred there and went to school there in the 20 years that I lived there. And so she's very South African. And, and so she works there. Uh, my son, um, so my daughter is 26. My son is uh, 13 or turning 13 uh, this month, in fact, in a couple of weeks' time. And he goes to school um, in Europe. And so I get to see him when I travel and I'm there to spend time with him or when he comes for holidays. And then I have um, uh, a two year old daughter who's with me here. Um, uh, who then, uh, you know, uh, gives me joy every day to get home and, and just reminds me why I do what I do. So that answers the having the family thing. Uh, in terms of creating time for them, I have a lot of time for them. 
uh, I do several things in my day. As I've described, I go to work and when I'm at work, I'm completely dialed in into that aspect. When I'm at home, I'm completely dialed into that aspect. I don't carry work home if I, I can avoid it. I might look at an email here or there or approve something for payment here or there, but I, I try and avoid uh, working at home so that you can dedicate that time uh, to the family. My weekends are completely, my phone is put away and I have time for anything at home, including the dog. If the dog wants to go for a walk, that's what I'll do. And so it's very important that uh, you, you create that balance. Uh, people call it work-life balance. I don't know if that is appropriate because it prioritizes work. I would say your life comes first because if you don't have that, you wouldn't be able to work. And if your family is not solid enough to support you, you wouldn't be able to do the things that you want to do. I even have time for my friends. I have a very, very, very small group of friends that if they call me, I am available at short notice. And so um, that means that uh, you stay engaged. You're not isolated because these jobs, especially when you get to the top, they, they can be lonely in the sense that if you get engulfed in what you do every day, um, you have no time for anything else. And so the, the deliberate aspect of creating that time for me, Thursday afternoons, be at the club, go and play golf with whoever you're playing golf with. That is one thing. Saturdays and Sundays, you're just not available for anybody else except very close friends and your family, you know? And, and those friends are spending time with you, with your family. And so you're not compromising one for the other. And um, I, I find that balance actually very easy to maintain. Hey. Thank you. So there's one more question. Uh, how do you introduce a different set of cultures that will be progressive to people? And most importantly, how do you maintain sustainability in the same in institutions that are hell bent on their culture, systems, ways of doing things that they are have continually um, practiced since time immemorial without being termed as radical, overbearing, arrogant, or downright? irritant as you aim to change culture? By having the traits that I talked about, bedrock on humility, but having that charisma, that intellectual uh, stimulation and the empathy. People don't follow you because your ideas are good. <laughs> People follow you because they feel connected to what you want to do, the vision that you do have. Now, culture is, a lot of people struggle with changing culture. Culture doesn't change overnight. Culture takes time to change. But if you show the results quickly, culture changes very quickly. But there's an aspect of change that um, is ruthless. You know, if you are driving a bus and you want to go from Nairobi to Kisumu, you don't want passengers in that bus that are going to Kiambu. Because they'll make noise at you when you get to Naivasha. Oh, where are you going? Take us to Kiambu. That nonsense. Because we said this bus is going to Kisumu. If you don't like it, don't be on this bus. And so the, the, the certain elements of leadership that are call for strength in decision-making and decisiveness. I told you that's one of the top three traits I, I believe you should have. So if you see people on your bus that are not wanting to go where you want to take them, let them off. You don't have to fight with them. You don't have to be arrogant. You don't have to like, you know, make a big issue out of it. They're just not on the vision that you've set. Now, how do you know your vision is correct? First of all, you don't create it alone. You create it with people that are important. And that's why for me, that core leadership group is really critical. And in my case, the board as well, really, really critical. Uh, three senior management team uh, and the bigger strategic team that we have in the business. So uh, right now we are reviewing our current strategic uh, direction to set a new one because we've achieved the results that the current one wanted us to achieve. I can't do that on my own. I could with City and write it, but then it's my vision. But if I do it with the top 14 leaders in Sassini, Top 40 people believe, wow, this is what we all want to do. When I take it to the board, which is seven people, they rarely challenge it because we've thought through all the aspects they might add one or two things and then we go. But the moment you do that, everybody has dialed into it. And so you've removed all those negative aspects in the question, arrogance or uh, being, being an irritant. You can't be an irritant if you're a transformational leader. But the situations that call for you to be an irritant, you must be able to be an irritant to change those situations to keep on course. That irritation sometimes is in just saying and putting your foot down and saying, I'm not going to attain non-performance. So if you don't want to jump into this and drive it to where I want to drive it, look for another job. And we've had to do that in Sassini. Um, again, uh, I'll use, let me use the tea business again, if you don't mind. 
When I joined in March 2019, we had an MD there that had been in that business for 20 years. Uh, and within weeks of working with him, it was clear with me uh, that you know there needed to be a different direction. So in April of 2019, we replaced him and we got a new MD. So that new MD joined a month after me. And in seeking him out, uh, I was looking for trades that are similar or better than mine, and somebody that could transform that business or help me to transform that business and then transform Sassini. The leadership team we found in that business was about 16 people at top leadership level. In the first one year, we lost all of them, except one. Um, because one, they couldn't keep up with the vision and the drive that we had. And two, they didn't have the intellectual and the ethical uh, um, competence to do what we wanted. And so we had to let some of them go. And some of them just left on their own. That one that remained worked with us for a period of two years, then also eventually left. So if you look at the tea business today, the leadership structure there in terms of people in the top leadership, there, all new, all achieving, all aligned to the vision that we want for that business. You can't be scared of dealing and taking um, the you know, decisions around things you don't want. So once you're clear with the vision, once you form that vision with your team and that strategy is supported by that team, don't take nonsense from people who don't want to achieve. That doesn't make you a bad person. It just makes you focus. But if you are empathetic in the way you deal with that, you have a nice way of doing it. There's zero chance of you being an irritant. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I can see no more, uh, more questions in the chat box. So anyone... um, so this is Dr. Ndieki lecture in the Department of Hobbs and Gaini, um, and also part of the Wellness Forum. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Your classmate, uh, Tom Dienya, former classmate from Aseno School, says hi. Um, I love what you talked about, taking risks, but what you do should scare you being humble because being arrogant, even arrogant people will not want to follow you. And uh, the concerns that people have raised are pretty valid uh, because most of the time as doctors, we are thrown into leadership roles pretty early. Like you have to be a medical superintendent or you have to be a medical officer of health. Most of the time you have to lead uh, uh, teams in the wards. So I feel what you've told us is very, very practical because most often times, as you said, with the different generations, you, most of the time you want to bring a cultural shift and there's this resistance that you meet. And I feel like you've really given us important things that we can even actually start implementing even today. So I'm very grateful for that. I just wanted to say that and Egle, over to you. Yeah, thank I, you I, very much. Dr. Dienya is, is a classmate from, from Masana School. I'm very happy to hear he's on the call. Um, he used to challenge us when we were in school around reading culture. So I, I hope he still reads. And uh, yeah, I, I think, um, uh, Dr. Ndeki, you raised something that maybe I didn't handle, if you don't mind me just spending a few seconds on it. I think there was a question around sustainability to ensure that whatever actions you put in place uh, don't disappear with you when you leave the organization. And the way you do that is not just being consistent and being strong around those actions, but getting people to believe in the same thing. And so it becomes institutionalized. It becomes a culture of the organization. It's not being done because Martin is driving it. It's being done because this is what Sassini believes in. And irrespective of whichever MD comes, uh, you know, these this certain aspects are going to stay uh, the same. And that's what you call culture. If you go to some of these organizations, the certain things that you know are basic to what their success looks like and that's really really important sustainability is a very broad subject and that's something that um, you know I, I don't know how much of that is being driven in the medical field but for us now as corporates we're very serious about running businesses in a way that we want them to be there for eternity Sassini is 71 years old it wouldn't be here if it wasn't doing its business in a sustainable way the four areas we focus on human rights uh, good labor practices, um, protection of the environment, and anti-corruption. We are very serious about those. If you look at what we do in our business, those aspects in the 10 principles of the sustainability drive globally are entrenched in our strategy. And so that's the way we handle that. And so thank you so much. I'm glad that I was able to add value. And uh, I hope that uh, you know this is something that you guys can pick, even if it's just one lesson that you can put into your, into your role. There was a final question around when you're thrust into leadership without training, what do you do? Uh, one, seek the training if you have gaps. Two, seeking training that I mean I look for the organization to put me in a class. Sometimes is I look and drive for opportunities to train myself to be better, to learn what I don't know. I have accepted jobs where I had no experience in them before. 
but within months, you wouldn't know that I didn't have experience there because you then thrust yourself into learning and reading and asking. And people think that when you're a leader, you know everything. My biggest trait is to ask questions, especially those that are considered stupid because out of that comes a lot of lessons. So there's a lot of this growth that you drive yourself. And I hope this is useful for all of you. And thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for your participation. And uh, before we close, I would just like uh, to ask Mr. Martin to give us your parting shot. What would you say to us? I admire what you guys do. Uh, I think that the profession you've chosen is a very difficult one. Uh, I can't imagine whenever I'm sick and I go to hospital and I look at doctors treating me and I think, this is what you do every day, you know, being in this situation where the other person on the side of the table you're talking to is distressed about some situation in their life. And you're able to, you know, calm them down and treat them. And in that process, sometimes you lose some of them. That can be very distressful. So I really am a big admirer of, uh, you know, what you do, wanting, having wanted to be a doctor myself when I was in school. Um, but in that admiration comes a challenge for you, uh, seeking growth, uh, because there's so many doctors now I hear the government doesn't even have enough spaces to employ the ones coming out of college. How do you differentiate yourself from the next doctor to be able to add value, not just to yourself, to your patients, but to the organization that you work in? And these topics that we are talking about, I'm glad you have a wellness program that, uh, that you, you, you're aligned to. This topic we are talking about is really critical in you know, isolating yourself as somebody that is different. Don't be afraid of leadership positions. Take them, even when you don't have the experience to do them. Then learn and do them well. Don't take them for the sake of, you know, you want to earn more money. And I always say to people, money is a motivator for a lot of people. But for me, what is more motivational is the ability to succeed. Am I joining or taking a role where the culture allows me to do, make a difference? Because when you do that, the money follows you. There's just no two ways around it. The money will follow you. Don't put money ahead when you're seeking these leadership positions because that's not why you're a leader. And that's why that humility is really critical. But the experience it gives you, the opportunity you get from that leadership position, if you do that well, the money comes. So I would encourage all of you, if you feel you need more on the subject, feel free to call me. I think the Tom Cabana has my contacts. You can share those, I really don't mind. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we can make this industry of yours as successful and very strong leaders as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that very uh, insightful discussion. So uh, this, uh, for, for everyone asking, uh, Dr. Zefana is saying we are proud of you as Maseno Boys Association. <laughs> okay, for everyone asking for the recording, this will be in the university website, so you can get it from there. Thank you very much again, once again, uh, Mr. Martin Ocheng for creating time. I understand you have your AGM right after this. Uh, so I think we are we are good, we are done. So I'll just invite Dr. Onbieki, maybe you have something to say as we close. I just want to say thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, to our speaker for making time. We, we had an issue in February because we were having exams and uh, the schedule through us a bit off. So we know we also inconvenienced you a bit. So thank you very much for just uh, standing with us and uh, showing up. And I feel uh, we'll be different people and we'll grow, especially more so because we expected to be leaders. There's that cultural expectation or even societal expectation to perform. So thank you very much. And also thank you very much everybody for showing up, for showing up for yourselves. Um, let us grow, let us impact each other, let us inform other people of this uh, wellness forum because the more of us, the more people transform, the more of our societal transformation we are going to have. So thank you very much everybody. Okay, have yourselves a good day and a good weekend. You too, thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone.